Americans during the Civil War era were not prudes. While intimacy was clearly not a topic for polite discussion or reputation-aware middle-class members, many still had these desires. Traditional Civil War history focuses on heroes and battles rather than sex and birth control. This ignores reality. For the young, unmarried men and a small number of disobedient married ones, life in the army offered them fresh opportunities to seek sex, usually with prostitutes. For the first time, many farmers and uneducated workers could live outside of strict parental and religious restraints. Military service exposed them to the outside world of violence, drinking, and sex. At the camp, barracks favorites were offered. These were affordable sexual novels. Nudity photos were also available, and both enlisted men and officers purchased them. These 12 by 15 inch photographs cost $1.20 for a dozen or 10 cents per picture. These were mainly images of naked women doing innocent things. Naked ladies participating in true sex activities were usually black or Indian, not white. Because the soldiers were so far away from their wives and sweethearts, these were used for pleasuring themselves rather than entertainment. Only three of the novels are still known to exist, and they are kept at Indiana University. This includes books such as Fanny Hill and Memoirs of a Pleasure Woman. Fanny Hill, first published in England in 1748, represents the story of an innocent country girl who is lured into prostitution. The book reads like a list of naughty behaviors, such as same-sex acts, public sex, and flagellation, which was popular at the time. In a letter to the newspaper, an unnamed soldier raised concerns, characterizing men as reading flimsy publications, obscene books, and the worst species of yellow-covered literature. Pornography only became a problem for commanding officers when men were not actively involved in campaigns. The demands of campaigning pushed the soldiers to be disciplined, giving no time to consider what they were reading or carrying in their haversacks. However, this doesn't mean that females were unavailable for sex. Prostitutes were among the camp followers who accompanied the marching troops. According to popular legend, they were so common in the Army of the Potomac under Union Commander Joseph Hooker's command that the term Hooker was developed to call them. Even though the phrase had been in use, since 1845. Soldiers were separated from their families' protecting influence, while men were separated from their wives' loving embrace for months, if not years. Even the most devoted husbands may struggle with this. For example, Samuel Cormany, who was happily married, cheated on his wife Rachel while serving in the 16th Pennsylvania Infantry. When he came home in 1865, he confessed his sin to Rachel, describing the very worst features of my shortcomings and lapses. Many Americans attacked prostitution as a social evil during the antebellum period. Early women's rights activists saw prostitution as proof that men's sexual desires lead to ruined women. Health reformers said that extramarital sex depleted men's vital energy. However, this moralizing did not affect women choosing the world's oldest profession, nor did it prevent troops from visiting these public ladies, especially amid the social and economic chaos of the war years. Prostitution expanded the greatest between 1861 and 1865. Some historians believe that this growth was caused by the depression and the need for women to support themselves and their families while their husbands were away at war. Other historians believed that the rise in prostitution was caused by women's desire to pass on genital illness to enemy troops. Following the start of war, the number of brothels increased dramatically. In 1864, there were 450 brothels in Washington and more than 75 in nearby Alexandria, Virginia. There were 5,000 public ladies in the district and another 2,500 in Alexandria and Georgetown. Prostitution was especially common in the towns surrounding the camps. When soldiers established camps nearby, the sex trade took over these little towns. One soldier wrote home to his wife, It is said that one house in every ten is a filthy house. It is a perfect Sodom. Tennessee was the most known prostitute hotspot. Smoky Row, in what is now downtown Nashville, evolved 
from an awkward city secret to a bustling red light district with over 1,500 prostitutes. Many of the ladies were southerners who turned to sex work to support themselves when their male family members went to war. Bentony e. Dubs, a union private, wrote, There was an old saying that no man could be a soldier unless he had passed through Smoky Row. The street was roughly three-fourths of a mile long, and every house or shack on both sides was a house of bad fame. Women have little regard for clothing or morality. They claim that Smoky Row killed more soldiers than the war itself. Venereal disease, notably gonorrhea and syphilis, was an inevitable consequence of paid and mostly unprotected sex during the Civil War. Confederate soldier J.M. Jordan, for example, wrote home to his wife in 1864 that, while the health of his regiment was good, they were dealing with a certain type of disease. I feel a delicacy in spelling them out to you because you are a female person, but I reckon you can't blush little things these days. I've contracted pox and clap. The surgeons treated nearly 73,000 Union white troops for syphilis and more than 109,000 for gonorrhea. The frequency of these diseases among African-American soldiers was less than half that of white troops. In the eyes of military command, prostitutes and camp followers drove venereal disease to dangerous levels, endangering military readiness. Confederate General A.P. Hill is thought to have contracted gonorrhea while at West Point and suffered from it until his death in the final weeks of the war. Other ladies' men, such as Hugh Judson Kilpatrick, George Armstrong Custer, and Jeb Stewart, are thought to have had some sort of venereal disease. So, in July 1863, Union Provost Marshal George Spaulding started rounding up prostitutes and forcing them to board the USS Idaho. However, after the ship was denied safe harbor in Louisville, Cincinnati, and every other port it tried to enter, it returned to Nashville, damaged by the women who had been living there in horrible conditions. The Union Army would have to try a different method. The women's failed journey north aboard the Idaho, a rented boat forever known as the Floating Whorehouse, marked the beginning of a bizarre time in the city's history. Spaulding began a broad campaign against sexually transmitted diseases in August 1863. He directed the construction of a hospital for prostitutes with sexual diseases. Prostitutes had to register for a license to carry out their trade. Part of their earnings were going to the hospital. Prostitutes were required to go through frequent health inspections and be admitted to the hospital if they got an illness. In addition, the city constructed a separate hospital for syphilitic soldiers. The plan was a success. Not only did the number of soldiers stationed in Nashville with sexually transmitted illnesses decreased, but hundreds of prostitutes applied for permits. The city's reputation for vulgar, bluntly dressed prostitutes gave place to cleanliness and propriety. Quick fun fact, in the 1860s, condoms were produced from animal skin and rubber and were sometimes referred to as preventatives or French letters. Previously, condoms were produced from animal intestines, typically from sheep, calves, or goats. The condoms were held in place by a string looped around the base of the genitalia. Some soldiers committed acts of rape. The Confederate records were destroyed, but an examination of only 5% of federal documents reveals that over 30 court-martial trials were held for rape. The typical punishment for such crime was hanging or firing squad. Offering money to a white lady in good standing for sex was considered almost as rape itself. In the case of an Illinois private at Camp Denison, for example, the soldier served a month in the prison for offering a mother a dollar and her daughter three dollars for sex. While invading the southern states, federal troops committed rape on more black women than white ones. However, black soldiers were typically punished harsher than their white counterparts. Soldiers who had same sexual desires also served in the Civil War. For example, in his memoirs, Union General Sheridan describes a pair of women as two Amazons who were somehow recruited as soldiers. While serving in the army, an intimacy had sprung up between them. They secured a supply of Applejack, got very drunk, fell in a river, and almost drowned. During their recovery, their sex was revealed. No male army soldiers were disciplined for gay activities, but three pairs of Union Navy sailors were punished for it 
in 1865. Only one example of male prostitution was reported during the war. On May 13, 1862, the Richmond Dispatch reported that prostitutes of both sexes were exposing themselves in carriages and on sidewalks. There were some rumors that Confederate Major General Patrick Cleburn was gay, although it is still disputed. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and press likes.